Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is off tonight. COVID crowd control. Didn't think it was going to be this crazy, but it's absolutely insane. <laughs> Long weekenders get too close outdoors, and in Quebec, it's growing indoor gatherings that doctors are calling dangerous. It can just spread wildly. 250 people can gather inside, some with masks removed. Trouble with Canada's new COVID alert app. It needs to work for all Canadians. Why so many say they're shut out. The salmonella outbreak widens. I just threw everything out. <laughs> why some onions are making people sick. Speaking out against Beijing. Is there not a chance that you could be spirited away in the middle of the night to a prison in mainland China? Yes, but what can I do? Just keep quiet? Hong Kong's media tycoon risking it all to fight China's national security law. This is The National. Millions of pandemic-weary Canadians are saying so long to another holiday weekend. Heading into the break, health officials warned again about observing safety protocols to prevent a COVID comeback. And again, we see that not everyone played ball. We start off with Stephanie Mercier's look at some alarmingly packed hotspots. A sunny, long weekend means people flocking to trees and nature trouble is they're escaping to the same places as everyone else. This Alberta trail was overrun. Didn't think it was going to be this crazy, but it's absolutely insane. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's crazy busy. It's amazing how many people actually come and do this. As soon as we went down to go do the hike, it was kind of madness down there. There was way too many people and we just felt uncomfortable. So we ended up walking back up just because, I don't know, it, since there's a pandemic going on, it just feels weird to hike around 100 other people. Elsewhere, it was beaches that were jammed. In an effort to control the number of people at any given place, lots of regions have been closing parking lots and turning people away, like in Prince Edward County, Ontario, and the lower mainland of BC. Parking lot was full, so we had to turn around and find another parking spot, and now we're waiting for the bus. We have been rerouted and now kind of trying to figure out what else we can do in the meantime so that we can get ourselves to the hike. Yeah, so, uh, have your confirmation on that? BC has started issuing day-use passes for some popular areas, but some suburban mayors say that's just pushing people to crowd into smaller local parks. We ought to be coordinating to make sure that all of our facilities are open and that we can spread out uh, this large number of residents that want to find the, the park, uh, spread them out more. To their point, just a few kilometres away, so it's um, quite empty. Yeah, there's usually a lot more people here, I would say. Quite a few boaters, as usual, and yeah. um, it's been very, very pleasant. I see good uh, social distance, uh, everything is very good. Showing there is still enough outdoor space to go around safely. Stephanie Mercier, CBC News, Vancouver. Now, this was not a long weekend in Quebec, but some may celebrate this. Starting today, the province allows public gatherings of up to 250 people, even indoors. That's up from 50, which is still the rule for most provinces. But as Anthony Nerestant tells us, some doctors are sounding the alarm. Pat Garipo says the pandemic has sucked the life out of his reception hall business. Almost all his weddings have been postponed, costing him $800,000 in lost revenue. 2020 was supposed to be the year, a big year for the wedding industry. The whole wedding industry was exploding this year. And here you have it, it's a disaster right now. It's in shambles. The new rule that lets up to 250 people gather in indoor and outdoor public spaces is designed to help venues like his recover. But a group of Quebec doctors is calling the change dangerous and unnecessary because droplets can linger in enclosed spaces. The problem is that if you have people spreading an infection within a large group, it becomes an event where there's just not, not just a few people infected, but possibly a lot of people infected, and it can just spread wildly. The new rule applies to venues like theaters and cinemas and to amateur sporting events. Also worrying for doctors, once you're seated, you can take your mask off, and you only need to stay a meter and a half away from others not the usual two meters required in other settings in Quebec. We'd love to see if there was any science or any rationale or what the science or rationale is behind this and how we've decided to go from 50 
all the way to 250 in one fell swoop. Dr. David Zucker helped launch a petition among doctors asking the government to scrap the plan. But Quebec's director of public health says the risk is not the same as private gatherings, which are still limited to 10 people. 250 persons who are going to go to a show, sitting in a chair, separated by 1.5 meters, you know, I think that the risk there is very uh, acceptable. But it's those remaining safety measures that make Garipo doubt his wedding business is coming back soon. They don't want to have a funeral, a funeral. They want to have a wedding. Will 250 people want to gather at a wedding? He wonders when dancing and mingling are still not allowed. Anthony Nerestan, CBC News, Montreal. Not every province reported new COVID-19 numbers today, but of those that did, we see a dip across the board with one exception. Saskatchewan reported 17 new cases today, just over twice as many as Sunday. Manitoba saw seven new infections, less than half the day before. Quebec is down for the third day in a row with 123. Nova Scotia, New Brunswick and Newfoundland and Labrador all reported no new infections today. The federal government's new COVID alert app has been touted as key to keeping those numbers down. Designed to ping you if you've been near anyone who's tested positive, this app has already been downloaded 1.2 million times in just four days. But as Karen Pauls reports, there are problems right out of the gate. Gordon Payne is trying to download the new COVID alert app. It says I need a different version of the operating system that my phone cannot handle. It requires users to have Apple or Android phones made in the last five years and a relatively new operating system. Payne has an iPhone 6. Not everybody has the ability or the financial means to afford the latest technology that is required to run the software. This Ontario NDP legislator says her parents also tried, in vain, to download the app on their older iPhones. Now she and others are raising concerns about accessibility for older Canadians and marginalized groups, some of the most vulnerable people when it comes to COVID-19. It's not enough to build a tech tool that works well for, for white Canadians or affluent Canadians. It needs to work for all Canadians or the government needs to be really, really clear as to why they are not doing so. For now, the app is only linked to the Ontario health care system. Atlantic Canada will likely be next. This Manitoba restaurant owner has been trying to follow what he calls confusing public health orders. When you walk around the patio, you can see all the tables and chairs are, are spaced out. He knows his industry is front line, so even though he's not a fan of more government intervention, if the COVID alert app becomes available, he'll likely download it. To make sure that any people I'm with who, you know, could be seriously injured by a respiratory uh, virus, uh, protecting them and keeping them safe. Meanwhile, Gordon Payne has asked the Ontario government to fix the download problem. He's a high school teacher and will soon be surrounded by students. If I come into contact with them and one of them tests positive, I would really like to know that for the benefit of my health and the people around me. At least 65% of Canadians need to use the app for it to be effective. And that won't be possible unless the federal government finds a way to make it more accessible. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. A warning today from the World Health Organization as we approach 700,000 deaths globally from COVID-19. We all hope to have a number of effective vaccines that can help prevent people from infection. However, there is no silver bullet at the moment, and there might never be. Officials are telling countries with surging caseloads that the way out requires a sustained commitment to public health basics, testing, isolating, treating, and contact tracing. So as the world anxiously awaits a vaccine, a few contenders are already in the third stage of clinical trials. Christine Birak explains how a timeline that can normally take up to five years is being squeezed into about 10 months. For a new virus, it's never happened this fast before. Potential vaccines are entering final phase three clinical trials. It's a process that usually takes years, if not decades. So how can it be happening in months and without compromising safety? I believe it's possible. You just need to put the effort into it. And a lot of money. And a lot of money. 
At Laval University, Gary Kobinger is working on a potential COVID-19 vaccine. He says no one's sacrificing safety. Instead, vaccine development is mainly being sped up by advanced manufacturing, global cooperation, and designing flexible clinical trials. Now everything is compressed. People are lining up their phase two as they are doing their phase one. Phase one is a safety trial. The potential vaccine is given to a small number of healthy volunteers. Normally, one phase ends before another starts. But if early results show the vaccine is safe, health regulators continue to monitor it and allow phase two to run at the same time. Phase two and phase three can overlap as well. We're spending way more money than we would spend on a regular development track. Regulators worldwide, including Health Canada, are also working together to oversee the vast amounts of data from those trials, resulting in a much faster review time than the standard 300 days. If a vaccine proves safe and effective in getting the immune system to fight this coronavirus, those changes alone could shave years off the development process. But companies are also banking on that advanced manufacturing. Meaning, let's just invest in manufacturing, let's have the doses ready, and if the vaccine is a good candidate, we don't have to go back to do the manufacturing, we already have the doses available. It's never been done before, but leading COVID-19 vaccine contenders are now producing their vaccine. So even though it is a lot of investment to manufacture at risk, it is compressing timelines. Safety checks are baked in, but when a vaccine fails, and most of them do, it's expensive. Outside a pandemic, it's a risk few companies would ever take. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Another health warning for you tonight. A salmonella outbreak that started in the United States is getting bigger, and it's led to a wide recall of onions here in Canada. At least 120 people in seven provinces are sick, and 17 were sent to hospital. Susanna Da Silva has the details. Better safe than sorry is the mindset of this small grocer waiting to confirm from their supplier these onions are safe. They said that if you have any red onions, just bring them in the back and you have to throw them out. A salmonella outbreak linked to some California red onions is now a recall of all varieties of onions from the same company. I immediately went and checked and of course there's no stickers on anything, so I just threw everything out <laughs> just to be on the safe side. People began getting sick in the middle of June, 120 cases in Canada so far, 17 people have been hospitalized. In the United States, there are close to 400 cases. The onions have been sold across Canada under the names El Competidor, Imperial Fresh, Onions 52, Tender Loving Care and Thompson International. But if you're like me, when you get your onions home, you take them out of the bag and put them in your handy onion box. And some of them were also sold in bulk, which may mean you have no idea where your onions have come from. So officials say, when in doubt, throw them out. Cooking will kill it, uh, for definite. I think the big risk is that uh, because people uh, you don't associate onions with salmonella, is that when they've got a cutting board, for example, they'll peel the onion, they'll cut it up, and uh, then they'll put something down on that cutting board. In California, the source of the contamination is still unknown, but experts say likely either from the soil or contaminated water. As the state deals with droughts, water is being brought in from further away. There's less investment in food safety in the United States than a few years ago. And talk about COVID right now. Farmers are under a lot of pressure to produce. Back in Vancouver, this grocer got confirmation that these onions were grown in Washington and its supplier says they're safe. But that isn't enough to convince everyone to pick some up. Are you going to hold off on buying onions for a while? Probably for a little while until I hear anything else in the news. The Public Health Agency of Canada is also advising those ordering from restaurants to check where its onions are from. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Newfoundland and Labrador is getting a new leader. I know that together we can embrace a common goal of working towards a brighter future. Andrew Fury is now premier designate after winning the provincial liberal leadership race today. He's never held elected office, so he doesn't have a seat in the legislature. Fury did, however, have the backing of the outgoing premier, Dwight Ball, who announced his resignation in February amid growing scandals within his caucus. And the family of a missing Nova Scotia boy is now offering a $15,000 reward. They are pleading for any information that could locate Dylan Ehler. 
The three-year-old was playing in his grandmother's yard in Truro when he disappeared on May the 6th. There was an extensive search, but only his boots were found. His parents believe their son was kidnapped. Investigators have said they don't believe there was any foul play. In Toronto today, some parents of black students and their supporters took to the streets. They say Ontario must do a lot more than it already has to help those kids achieve their potential. Deanna Sumanek Johnson shows us what they want. The heat on a holiday Monday isn't stopping Stephanie Brambridge. Fighting, she says, is what she's used to. Three suspensions from October to uh, March. Just before to make COVID. sure her 11-year-old son is treated fairly by the school system. One of the suspensions was for him and another student getting into a fight, but the, the student had pushed him and first, um, while a group of kids were basically surrounding him and jostling him. Ontario recently dropped two policies that were found to have a negative effect on black students. We will reform suspensions for the primary grades, kindergarten, to grade three. And starting next year, we'll begin phasing out the practice of streaming for grade nine students. But these protesters say steering black students away from bright futures really starts in kindergarten, and that has to stop. Our children are being encouraged to leave the French immersion program. When, when they're in grade four and five, they're being told they have a learning disability without even being tested, just because my two children went through that. They also want inclusion of the black Canadian experience in many subjects throughout the curriculum and accountability and training for teacher bias and racism. In an email to CBC News, a spokeswoman for Ontario Education Minister Stephen Lecce said he remains committed to working with racialized families to drive further progress and equal opportunity for all Ontario students. Being young and black. Some protesters did notice Lecce took action when systemic racism was alleged at a major school board. He's listening. He's listening. He's learning. Do you think the government is going to respond to this? Well, to me, but, um, me just uh, myself, no, I don't. I don't believe so. No matter what happens, these parents and students say they're done staying quiet. If their demands are not met, anything from more protests to mass school walkouts are on the table. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Tonight, an interview with a man determined to fight Beijing and save Hong Kong. Is there not a chance that you could be spirited away in the middle of the night to a prison in mainland China? Yes. But what can I do? Just keep quiet? Ahead tonight, media tycoon Jimmy Lai with a warning. Hong Kong might be finished. What's really behind Donald Trump's demand to stop mail-in ballots in the election? Will they be stolen from mailboxes as they get put in by the mailman? There is zero evidence. And he just wanted something to sell online, but he ended up reuniting with a woman who helped change his life. By any chance, are you the Miss Ayotte that taught 1997 kindergarten at Spruce Grove Public School? We're back in two. The 2020 U.S. presidential election is shaping up to be like no other. The struggling incumbent is seemingly intent on attacking the whole process, even saying as much today. Universal mail-in ballots is going to be a great embarrassment to our country. But amid a raging pandemic, the demand for mail-in ballots is growing, despite Donald Trump's efforts to politicize them. Katie Simpson explains. I'm very worried about mail-in voting because I think it's subject to tremendous fraud and being rigged. They're going to be rigged. They're going to be a terrible situation. It's going to lead to total election fraud. To the president, the pandemic is not reason enough to change the way Americans vote, claiming election results will be compromised if mail-in ballots are widely used. Will they be stolen from mailboxes as they get put in by the mailman? Will they be forged? Who is signing them? Who's signing them? Will they be counterfeited? Maybe by the millions by foreign powers. 34 states and the District of Columbia currently allow some form of voting by mail. And with COVID, more states are debating their options. There is zero evidence uh, to back up the idea that uh, uh, mail-in ballots are somehow compromised. Um, they're not.
It is widely believed Trump sees mail-in voting as a benefit to Democrats by making it easier for more people to participate. In past elections, Democrats have fared better when the turnout is strong. Though in these unprecedented times, Trump's rhetoric may actually hurt Republicans. If they have uh, a large chunk of their supporters are the elderly, who most likely do not want to go to a poll, physically go to a poll to expose himself uh, to COVID, well, then uh, it makes all the sense in the world that they'd want to have access to a mail-in ballot. In Florida, senior citizens make up 21 percent of the vote. Ahead of next month's primary, election organizers say there is real fear of exposure for voters and staff. We have a lot of people who previously who have been poll workers who are in that vulnerable category where they are over 60 or 65 and therefore not as comfortable and not able to work. By attacking the process, Trump is already sowing doubt about the credibility of the results, giving him an excuse if he loses the election. He's already publicly warned he's not sure if he will accept the outcome in November. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Staying in the United States, Hurricane Isa Isas is on track to hit the Carolinas. Tropical storm and hurricane warnings are in place all the way from Florida to Maine, affecting more than 100 million people. It's forecast to reach eastern Canada midweek as a tropical depression. And crews in California continue to battle a massive wildfire just east of Los Angeles. The Apple Fire, as it's known, sparked Friday. It has since grown to more than 8,000 hectares, forcing thousands to evacuate. More than 1,300 firefighters are working to contain this one. And two years after a deadly collapse, a new bridge in Genoa, Italy reopened today. Political leaders attended the event, which honored the 43 people killed in August of 2018. Many relatives of the victims declined an invitation, however, saying they want those responsible to be held accountable. It's believed years of neglect led to that collapse. Next, a rare conversation with a man determined to fight Beijing. Is everything you're saying here, sir, actually a violation of this new security law? Yes. And, and that doesn't worry you? No. But what can I do? Just keep quiet? Hong Kong media tycoon Jimmy Lai on why he's risking speaking out on what he says Canadians need to know. And later, the push to do more to care for Alberta's orphaned grizzly bears. We'll be right back. Hong Kong is in trouble, not just because of a new COVID outbreak that threatens a lockdown more severe than the first, but because of another existential crisis. Its long-awaited election has been postponed for a year, seen as another attempt to silence dissent. And that comes on the heels of a new national security law imposed by Beijing this summer. It is so strict, some outspoken souls are declaring Hong Kong is dead. No matter who you are or where you live, if you openly criticize the government or suggest freedom or independence, you could very well be arrested if you ever set foot in Hong Kong. The fight for its future is getting more dangerous. Where there is a will, there is a Hong Konger with a way. Blank sheets held up in protests this summer, saying nothing but meaning everything after Beijing imposed its national security law banning certain slogans of protests. Clever, but only fleetingly effective. Scared activists now scramble to erase social media posts. Those who can are leaving Hong Kong. Because they know the arrests under the new harsh law have started. Opposition figures and some student activists like Tony Chung, who was picked up seemingly for a Facebook post about independence. But so the fear goes, he won't be the last. It's very sad. People are panicked. Hong Kong media tycoon Jimmy Lai, long a supporter of the protest movement, accepts that he is watched every day. I'm follow. I'm follow. Just, just this morning, my driver told me that, you know, look at the young kid, you know, on the left side. He's there every day and trying to see what time I leave home and all that. You don't sound scared by that. I, I can't be scared. If I'm scared, what can I do? I cannot say anything. I cannot do anything. Because the, the most skillful thing that the, the CCP can do is to induce fear in you, so to subdue you. 
This is a man who walks his talk, and not just as the owner of Apple Daily, a media outlet openly critical of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, and Hong Kong's leadership. Last summer, when Hong Kong's streets were places of promise and momentum, and the world was watching, Jimmy Lai was front and center both organizing and participating in some of the protests designed to push in part for democratic reforms. That's among the reasons why he was arrested earlier this year. It didn't silence him, though. If you say anything wrong or hurt the Chinese government, or you decide in a way that you disturb hostility to the CCP, you are liable to the crime of subversion? Would you have believed it last year if someone had said to you, one year from now, the national security law will be in place? No, no, I, nobody expected that. This rush implementation of the national security law is actually a blunder that CCP hasn't thought it through. It's a great blow to its economy at the time when China's economy is in thy situation. Is everything you're saying here, sir, actually a violation of this new security law? Yes. And, and that doesn't worry you? No. Is there not a chance that you could be spirited away in the middle of the night to a prison in mainland China? Yes. But what can I do? Just keep quiet? And so he's staying put, has told his family they can leave if they need to, has told his staff of the newspaper he doesn't want them to be martyrs, but they should do what they feel is right. So the criticism of Beijing goes on. But Hong Kong, he suggests, will effectively be finished if the rest of the world, including countries like Canada, don't speak up. If we are compatient, if we just let them do whatever the dictatorial value the world one day will have to be changed to the image of China. How, how mistaken we have been thinking that when China grow richer, we'll be more like us, and how, how wrong we have been. The more voices in Hong Kong that go quiet, the more his stands out. He says his chief worry is for the young, who grew up in a Hong Kong of free expression and now face an increasingly constrained future under Chinese control. Multiple nations, including Canada, have canceled extradition treaties with Hong Kong. Go further, he says, offer political asylum to young activists, then keep pushing. The leverage is you're united with all the country in the West. That is the leverage. All the other country has to, has to be united together to have the leverage. Canada isn't just any other country to Jimmy Lai. His ties here are strong. His twin sister and mother have lived in Ontario, his family buying and building businesses throughout Niagara-on-the-Lake. So he worries about Canadians, too. My advice to the Canadian, I think you have, to, you have to consider you'll be more cautious of what you do, what you say. If you want to still, you know, come to Hong Kong and have a business with Hong Kong, yeah, have to be more cautious. You know, you just can't do the same as you did before. This is not the same. No, it's not the same Hong Kong. And for all his bravery, make no mistake, there are moments he is afraid and desperately sad. Your sister in Niagara on the Lake must be very worried about you. Well, <laughs> well, yes, they'll go on. Yeah. Thank you for Thank you, letting Mr. me to talk to talk to your people. Jimmy Lai's trial is coming up. He could face 25 years in jail. Time for a quick break. Up next, a Canadian idea that could change health care around the world. Hello? Hello? We take a ride along with paramedics making house calls, a virtual triage to keep patients out of the ER. Welcome back. COVID-19 has forced us to take a hard look at our healthcare system. In some areas, it's pushed it to the brink, but 
It's also sparked some revolutionary ideas, like the one we first showed you in May. Paramedics in one Ontario county are using a virtual triage system that helps take the pressure off of hospitals. They invited us along for a ride along. There are still the emergencies now. The inevitable wrenching calls that end the way you might expect with a panicked, terrifying trip to the hospital. But this is not about that. Hi, it's Stephanie calling from the Community Paramedic Program. How are you? You're waiting for me? Perfect. Because <laughs> I'm coming out. This is about a COVID era experiment with paramedics. Hello? Hello? I've got some friends with me today. Is that okay? We're all in masks. Oh, look at you with the heat pad on your arm. How are you feeling? And this possibly is a peek into the future. We're doing methotrexate today? Yeah. Okay, and your blood work. Paramedic house calls for those who can't see family doctors now and don't need or want an ER. You're not feeling like dizzy or oh, no. no new cough, shortness of breath. Forge. Everything in it's... <laughs> is that a sickness, Forge? <laughs> you know what? It's, it's hard right now, right? It's like so difficult. Everybody's kind of facing the same stuff. Renfrew County paramedic Stephanie Rose, filmed by her colleague taking a little blood, administering a shot for Annette. When I saw that and I thought, well, you know, how nice is that? You don't have to go and sit in the emergency for yeah, four hours. Exactly. Right? For something and that can be fixed pretty quickly. It can be fixed at home and you're so more comfortable at home instead of laying on a stretcher for hours. We will get out of your hair. Okay, Community you. paramedics countrywide have long done outreach work a bit like this. But when COVID started its march around the globe, Renfrew County's chief paramedic, Mike Nolan, started thinking bigger. What if there was a better way to deliver health care? He thinks he's found it, thinks he's now doing it. Everybody has access to a family physician 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And for those people that we can't help over the phone or over a video conference, the paramedics are in their homes that same day, making sure they have exactly what they need to stay safe and healthy. Uh, and the remainder, unfortunately, weren't able to get a hold of their family doctor or they weren't available because it was... Out Imagining new ways to care for people at home was brewing for a while for Nolan, but kicked into action the week the pandemic was declared. He worked with tech teams, paramedics and doctors, including Jonathan Fitzsimon, to develop VTAC, a virtual triage assessment center. So patients call and they speak to a receptionist and the receptionist takes their details and we see the schedule um, and as soon as a patient is booked in, I call them. Twelve days from our first conversation to getting approving from the Ministry of Health to going live. That's unheard of in healthcare. Because everything is possible with money and political will. Both of those may come to an end. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There, there is the risk that um, the funding for this ends. That, that tap can be turned off as quickly as it was turned on. And so a push to understand if this works. 2,500 patients cared for this way since mid-March. The bulk of the calls from people who don't have family doctors. I just heard the VTAC desk, uh, just looking to check in. With physician shortages here, a bigger role for paramedics could offer an answer. How are you doing, man? Here, doing these are for you. Oh, you know, it certainly did for Kim and Denise Groves, both tested positive for COVID-19, both able to recover at home, thanks in part to paramedic Matt Roussel. Yeah, I just actually wanted to see how you were doing. I'm doing very well, thank you. You look a lot better. Oh, I feel a lot better. Yeah. I think you saved my life. Well, <laughs> no, I was not worried. I was concerned, we'll put it that way, when yeah. I first saw you. But... Well, I was concerned too because I sure didn't feel very well. Dropping nope. off medication for Denise, who's still testing right. positive, and just checking in with Kim, now COVID-free and enormously relieved. He did you a solid. Oh, he did me a real solid. I think I would have kicked the bucket if he hadn't have done it, <laughs> truthfully. Oh, I couldn't even get off the couch. They had to help me into the bed. I was right done. And I'm sure glad that I got an IV put in me in bed, which was... That doesn't happen with paramedics too often when they come and give you an IV and take your blood, so... It was great. I didn't have to go anywhere. We'll be in touch, okay? All it's right. good to see, see you, Matt. Thank okay, you. take care. 
Canada. Would you like to see this represent yeah. a new type of health care in Canada? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think it'll... Um, it's progressing to this point now, and, and COVID just didn't give us didn't give us another chance to do something else. We didn't have a choice. We had to do this. Other counties, other countries are now curious about duplicating the program. This is to share their uh, great ideas, to share the Take evidence. a spin through Michael Nolan's paramedic WhatsApp group and you'll see a global ideas exchange happening at a breakneck pace. Nations further along in the COVID experience sending tips to those just starting including advice from Spain in wrapping the inside of ambulances in plastic to make them safer and easier to disinfect. It's already put into action in Renfrew County. It is, I think, the call to action of our generation. There is no going back. There is no sense of normal because I don't know anybody in the healthcare system that was entirely happy with it. But can you pull this off in a time when COVID goes away and everyone goes back to work and the, the roads are busy again and the schools are full? We can absolutely continue to provide this level of service for both COVID and non-COVID patients going forward, right? COVID will be replaced by the flu or the second wave or the third wave. That confidence will get tested and it's not clear how this would work in a city, but COVID has cut through the red tape. So now they leap in where needed. A last stop of the day at a senior's residence that is so far COVID free. The we miss you signs everywhere, a reminder that being safe isn't always being whole. A few more residents here need COVID swabs. Go. Check. Yeah. Double zone. Yeah. The paramedics are meticulous with their PPE and again wearing cameras. Cool. Ready? Yep. Journalists certainly not able to head inside. In a place with no visitors, the paramedics are kind Hello. company. Hi, Joan. Hello. This is Joan Walsh. She's mercifully in really good health, very much missed by her big family, and willing to come to the window for a chat. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. I'm an awful book reader, so I'm reading books. I've got eight children. Five, five sons in the valley and three daughters. Boy, they must all want to hug you. Is there anything you want to say to your children or your family? I, well, I tell them all the time I love them. And they tell me that too. I, I don't know what else to say. That's all there is at the end of the day. It's all yeah. that matters, right? Yeah. There we go. Keep yourself safe, okay, Joan? All right, my dear. The little things are the big things now. Care that takes its time, paramedics who go out of their way, and people imagining that when we're all out of this, maybe we will have built something better. There are nearly 9,000 COVID-19 related deaths in Canada. We've been taking you through the stories behind the numbers in a special project called Lives Remembered. Tonight, we hear from a friend of Wilma Morrison. My name is Ayo Adewumi, and I'm a friend to Wilma Morrison, who died of COVID-19 April 23, 2020, at the age of 91 years. She was a mentor, she was a teacher, and she was a great historian. Growing up as a black person in Canada, she never really felt quite accepted. She left high school in 1947 and attempted to get into the teacher's college, but that never happened. Next, she wanted to become a nurse, but it was the same story. They weren't accepting black people. So not until 1958, when she was able to get um, into the nursing school, not even as a nurse, but as an assistant nurse. Wilma was a selfless woman who fought passionately for the preservation of black history in Canada. She single-handedly fought for the preservation of the church right behind me and made sure the church got designated as a national heritage site, which was a great feat because the church is the only evidence of black people being around here for over 200 years. Wilma was of the opinion that if we don't know where we're coming from, it's difficult for us to know where we're going to. I see Wilma as the Harriet Tubman of our era. Harriet Tubman brought the people from the States to Canada, but Wilma told the story of the people. For somebody to come from such a humble background and make something out of themselves, it's a great achievement. 
Wilma will be really, really missed. The big question now is who is going to step into our shoes? Because she's left huge shoes to be filled. We've gathered more stories of people lost to COVID-19 on our website. You can find them at cbc.ca slash remembered. When we come back, a new idea for Alberta's orphaned grizzlies. Next, a look at why rehabilitating the bears is such a controversial idea. I'm Josh Block. Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner. Homeless encampments have grown across Canada during the pandemic. We'll talk about why advocates see this as an opportunity for lasting change in Canada's housing crisis. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. An Alberta wildlife facility is embarking on a pretty controversial project. It wants to rehabilitate orphaned grizzly cubs and send them back into the wild. The province currently doesn't allow this practice as the animals are easily habituated to humans and that can lead to some dangerous encounters. But others say this is worth a try. Carolyn Dunn explains. Lunchtime at Cochrane's Ecological Institute. Orphaned wildlife have been raised here and released back into the wild since the early 70s. Black bear cubs have been part of the program since the mid 80s, but not grizzlies. So the Institute is building a four acre fenced enclosure in the middle of its property. The idea is to be able to take care of grizzly orphans and then reintroduce them into their natural habitat. All to bolster Alberta's threatened grizzly population. Bears are vitally important for the health of the ecosystem where they occur. And to lose them, and they're less than 700 estimated uh, grizzly bears in Alberta. Currently, orphan grizzlies in Alberta are sent to zoos, euthanized, or left to let nature decide their fate. Gordon Stenhouse has been studying grizzlies for decades. He says there's simply a lack of data about successful release. The real challenge is that when people try to raise animals in captivity, it's very dif difficult, if not impossible, to avoid associating the presence of humans and being around humans uh, with food. A pilot project in BC has been met with mixed and unknown results, partially because many of the released grizzlies keep slipping their GPS collars. This year, these two are staying on the right track. Avoiding humans and human settlements so far, they haven't made any moves towards uh, to home towards any of the towns or anything, so that's good. The Cochrane Ecological Institute would like the chance to try it in Alberta. We want to do a study to see if it does work or it doesn't. Until they get government permission, the grizzly enclosures will double as a temporary home for other rescued wildlife. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Cochrane, Alberta. Next, a chance meeting after 23 years. They weren't trying to reunite, but the student and his kindergarten teacher ended up finding each other again. That's next in our moment. <laughs> Two decades ago, Nashot Kassem was just five years old when he came to Canada from Sri Lanka. Some of the first people he met were his kindergarten teachers. And he says those teachers just changed his life. And 23 years later, in an almost serendipitous way, Nashot found one of them, and that reunion is our moment. My family had just come to Canada, so I was about to start junior kindergarten. I was five years old, and right before I was about to start, my two kindergarten teachers came to the house and did a home visit. And my first memories of Canada are those two teachers and how warm and friendly they were. Fast forward 23 years, my mom had asked me to sell a flower stand, posted on Facebook Marketplace, and I got a message from a woman named Karen. And I just clicked on her on her Facebook profile just out of curiosity. I get this uh, text saying, Mrs. Dea, did you ever work uh, in a kindergarten at Spruce Court School in 1997? I said, well, I certainly did. So I send her the, a class photo that I had from 1997 and I circle myself and I say, I'm going to bring you that flower stand and I'm going to give it to you for free. I met her at Main Subway Station and just holding a flower stand because I was so excited to meet her. He was so sweet. Just some 
you know, serendipitous event on Facebook was just, it still feels unreal to me. Okay, this is a story we need right now. It turns out that home visit was something that the Toronto District School Board uh, did at the time just to help kids get to know their teachers. Clearly, she stuck with him. He is now doing his uh, uh, residency in pediatric dentistry at the University of Toronto. That is a national for August the 3rd. Good night.